Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mother and Refuge of the End Times. I'm Debbie Bird Smith here with Ron Ray and our very, very special guest, Francis Hogan. Um, we are just delighted to have you here today. For us, it's it's, it's morning. For Ron, it's evening. Uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, Frances Hogan and her teachings. She has been uh, teaching us, uh, lecturing and, and enlightening us about scripture for um, how many years? 60? Many years. Many, many years since the 1960s. Uh, we were just chatting and I, I said, well, I've, I've only been around listening to her for about 40 years. Um uh, but she's a renowned uh, scripture scholar, spiritual director, retreat leader, uh, lay missionary. Uh, you could just go on and on with her uh, uh, accomplishments. And uh, she's truly spent her life in service of the Lord and in service of, of teaching others uh, about the beauty of scripture and what we can learn uh, from our past and uh, the beauty of our, our great Catholic faith. So I just want to say welcome, Francis Hogan. It's a delight to have you here. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, you know, um, we'd love to hear you. Now, I, I know many of our viewers are going to be very familiar with her with you. Um, uh, some may not be as familiar, some of our younger, <laughs> younger, newer audience. Yeah. Um, but if you could, um, I, I just love it if you could just start by giving us a little bit of information, you know, how you grew up. You grew up one of nine children and uh, you were a war baby. You, you uh, lived in very uh, simple and slim means when you were a child and uh, 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 encountered God and really uh, came to know that, that he was calling you at a very young age. And if you could tell us some, some about that, about your your young years and uh, coming up. A small bit about it. Um, uh, Ireland was a, a third world economy when I was born. Uh, the whole nation was poor, but we were happy. We didn't know we were poor. Uh, and um, all your neighbors were your friends and you shared everything. Um, I remember saying to my mother, why don't you ever lock the front door? She said, they're all friends outside. Yeah. Um, we, we were uh, very hungry because there was very little food uh, during the Second World War. I was born in 1941. Uh, and I actually remember standing beside my father uh, for the accidental bombing of Dublin mm -hmm. by the Germans. Uh, they were trying to force us into the war. And um, so I, I remember hunger and poverty and everything. But what I remember about it was that we were free mm -hmm. and that we were happy and that God was everywhere. Um, as far as I was concerned, God was living with us in our home. Uh, to the point that even when I was sent away to boarding school, uh, I would write home and ask how Jesus was. <laughs> wow. I mean, it, it, as far as I was concerned, he was there. Um, my father was a born teacher. i never got an opportunity to actually uh, follow that career. Um, but in the evening times, he was very tall. Uh, and in the evening times, he would gather as many of the children on his knees. I have no idea how long the knees were, but they seemed to take an awful lot of children. <laughs> uh, and anyone who was free got onto the knee. And he would teach us history, geography, poetry, and religion. Now, I learned all of that before going to school at, at three and a half. <laughs> I remember about a month after going to the primary school for the first time, my dad saying to me, how are you, how are you getting on? I said, I'm bored. He said, Why are you already covered all this? <laughs> I said, you think we know nothing. <laughs> Whereas uh, sitting one night all by myself on the knee, which was a complete luxury because I mean, it almost never happened. I don't know where the others were. <clears throat> we were looking at a map of South America and I was able to name all the mountains and 
um, uh, rivers and big cities and everything in South America. This is before I went to school at three, at three years of age. Wow. And we had the map upside down because a small child doesn't care whether it's north or south. And I pointed to Terra del Fuego, the land of fire. And I said to my father, who lives there? And my father, being a born teacher, he knew that to get something through to a child, you've got to actually make some kind of physical contact. So he put his arms tightly around me, gave me a big squeeze, what he called a big hug, a big love, sorry. Uh, and he put his cheek down beside mine and he said, the people who live there have never heard of Holy God or your Blessed Mother. Now, he has no idea until the day he died what he actually communicated to me because it affected my entire life. And I turned around on his knee to look at him and to say something to my dad. But what I saw was the crucified face of Christ. Now, he didn't mind showing himself as a crucified to a three-year-old. That's why an awful lot of uh, untruth is told to children. We, we need to tell them the truth. A child can take it. So I looked at this crucified face, but it had a lovely, uh, gentle expression. And he looked me directly in the eyes and I said to him, I will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, they're not the words of a three-year-old. No. Uh, the Lord obviously put those words on my lips because I mean, my father was stunned and uh, there was complete silence between the two of us for what seemed an eternity but of course an eternity for a three-year-old is probably 30 seconds uh, <laughs> and, uh, but there was a, a very clear silence and my father never ever referred to it wow um, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, helping both of my parents to prepare for death. Uh, and uh, when I was helping my dad, I said to him one day, don't you remember that day? And I never said anything about that day. He said, do I what? <laughs> he said, I got the biggest shock of my life. I said, but you never talked to me about it. He said, how could I? I didn't know what to think. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I said, what did you experience? And he said, I discovered in one split second that I was standing in God's shoes. Wow. wow. He said, if he could look at you through me, he said, because I knew you were seeing him and I knew you were talking to him. And if he could look at you through me, he said, that was definitive for me. It was just, it was an incredible experience for both of us. Uh, and that's, that's what has governed my entire life. Mm. You know, well, quite a life it's been. Um, um, a missionary, and um, uh, uh, but you know, one of the things that, uh, and and what a world you grew up in then, uh, World War II, and a lot of um, uh, a lot a lot of people suffered. A lot of people uh, went without, uh, and there was a lot going on. But you had had the comfort of community and family and stability. Unfortunately, yeah. we have a and lot of three-year-olds. Yeah, a lot of three-year-olds aren't growing up in that kind of world today. No, they are very much impoverished today. Yes, in so many ways, yes. not only physically, but spiritually and, and yes. emotionally. Yeah, um, by comparison with the children of today, we were very rich. Mm -hmm. And whatever food we had was organic. We didn't even food. use that language. It was just pure food. Just, just food. From the food. garden. Yes. Yeah, it was, not, it was not interfered with with pesticides or mm. uh, anything else to improve it. Uh, mm. And so, mm. while it appeared externally that we were poor, we were actually very rich. Mm -hmm. I consider people today who have lots of money and lots of things uh, very poor when they don't have love and they don't have community and they don't have faith. And they don't have the security of knowing why they're in existence and that it has some meaning and that it's going somewhere. I consider that extraordinary poverty. And by comparison with that, what we grew up in was it. I mean, I, I wouldn't exchange it for anything. Well, it, it's it's hard to uh, it's kind of hard to see 
sometimes and to watch what's happening uh, in our world today. And uh, this was one of the things that we really wanted to kind of explore with you today because, um, you know, we've had these extraordinary um, events uh, coming uh, out of uh, just worldwide that's just been so crazy. I say everything is upside down and backwards. And um, it seems like, uh, you know, it's like a crazy quilt out there. Uh, none of the pieces seem to be falling together too well. And uh, But when we look at the history of the church and we look at the history of, of scripture, um, and we were talking earlier about, um, you know, what happened in the in the early days in the creation uh, and the creative days and the creative era, uh, uh, you know, Noah and, uh, you know, what happened to the society then and, and, mm. and what's happening with civilization now. There's much to compare it to, isn't there? Yes. Uh, I, I'm going to touch on something I shouldn't really touch on, which oh, is... Uh, <laughs> the founder that was used by the ancients and was kept by the the Qumran community uh, uh, was the most ancient calendar, and they divided the the time for the human race on the earth into seven eras, seven sections, seven thousand years, and they divided that up into centuries, and then sorry into days there was 10 days 10 is the number of fullness seven is the number of com 10 is the day of the number of completion and seven is the number of perfection and they divided the days up into jubilees uh, <clears throat> now the thing that is uh, extraordinary about this calendar is that uh, at the end of every two thousand years you have uh, a, a cycle that uh, a civilization rises, peaks, and disintegrates. And you have another cycle then that rises and peaks and disintegrates. Um, to just sort of uh, not spend the whole morning on this, we're at the end of a cycle. We're at the end of the church age, uh, Luke 21, 24, uh, that the... Jewish people would be oppressed until the age of the Gentiles was completely over. Mm. Now, the age of the Gentiles is being uh, coming to an end right now. Hence, you see disintegration in the earth, you see disintegration in society, you see disintegration in the church and all the rest of it. Um, and it's, it's, we're not to be surprised or shocked or anything else knowledge actually frees us um hosea 6 4 or 4 6 i forget which it is it's probably 4 6 says that without knowledge people perish without understanding you won't be able to uh, just uh, cooperate with what's going on in the earth and um, <clears throat> in order for this cycle to complete itself uh, maybe if I went back a bit, um, when I was introducing the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find this on, on either EWTN or uh, Shalom World in my programs on Matthew. I showed some of the early cycles of the world. For example, uh, the ancient Egyptian world uh, had a long, long time to develop, and it peaked at the time of Moses, when Moses, who was a son of God, small s, mm. uh, spoke to them and asked them that instead of their false gods, that they would worship the true God. And he demonstrated who the true God was to them in all the signs and wonders that unfortunately we call plagues. Um, and the people who uh, put their faith in the true God uh, followed Moses out of Egypt. That's the, the Exodus and started a completely new life. So they started a new cycle. Uh, <clears throat> and the incredible thing about Egypt is that uh, once the new cycle of the people of God started, Egypt went into steep decline, mm. steep decline. So Egypt turned out to be the womb in which 
the people of God were conceived and born and the exodus was their ejection from the womb. And so <clears throat> they were given approximately 2000 years to reach their peak when the actual son of God, one like Moses, but the real son of God came and challenged them to come with him into the new era. And during his lifetime, the two eras were overlapping. And so for the people who were following Jesus, um, they were living in both eras. And so it was a bit awkward for them because they were expected to fulfill the law of Moses and they were expected to live the new life of Christ as well. That was rather difficult. And then you get the crisis uh, <clears throat> in which the, the new people of God are turfed out of Israel. So Israel then had become the womb of the new people of God. Yes. They're, they're turfed out. Israel went into steep decline. What I mean by that is by the year 132 AD, they were actually exiled from their own land. They were no longer yes. allowed to live in it. So that's, that's sudden death. So then the church has been given 2,000 years to reach its peak. Yeah. And it has rejected the Christ. It has rejected Christianity. Mm -hmm. And if you reject the Christ and the Christianity, there's actually nowhere else to go. But in this steep decline that we're in, which means that, you know, they let go of the commandments, they let go of absolutely everything. So the demons come in and take over don't particularly want to go down that route at this moment because there's an awful lot that can be said about it. Mm. Because there's never a vacuum. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum is a scientific principle. Uh, and so if we throw God out, the demons come in. And they just come in in modern form, you know, all the rest of it. So you start doing all the same stuff that was done before. And if you look at the symptoms of the disease, the doctor will say, well, that's the disease that we had 100 years ago. We thought we had eradicated it, but obviously it's turning up again. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what's going on now, except that it's going on on a global scale. When at the time of Christ, when Israel had gone into uh, apostasy, it was on, only on a national scale. It didn't affect the rest of the world. Mm. What's happening now is that it's happening on a global scale and therefore it is a global crisis. And what's going to happen at the end of this uh, is something that I am very, very clear about and I've been telling people for many years, and that is that we have to have the death and resurrection of the church. It has to be. If you go back to... Um, John chapter 21, uh, you have that very interesting scene after the gospel. Uh, sorry, I should say after the gospel, after the resurrection, um, in which um, Jesus is uh, speaking to Peter and the apostles. Sorry, I'm going to try and turn this off. Um, after they have met Jesus at the Sea of Galilee and they've had breakfast with him, and he reappoints Peter in charge. Then he says to him, Peter, when you are old, they will take you to a place you'd rather not go to, which means prison and death. Okay. And then Peter says, what about him? <laughs> to John. Would you ever explain what you've just said to me? He just says, what about him? <laughs> what about John? And then Jesus said, what is it to you if he lasts until the second coming, until I come? And so, you know, as John himself said, you know, the rumor went around that John was going to last to the second coming. Well, he, he outlived them all, so they probably thought it was going to wait until yeah. the second coming. What people don't realize is that that's not just a statement of reality about uh, Peter and John. It's a prophetic statement on the part of Christ. At the time when this would become a reality, the church would be divided into the Petrine church 
and all the other believers. The Petrine church is represented by Peter. All the other believers are re represented by John. And in the Petrine church, when it was old, would have to be taken where it wouldn't like to go and actually give its life. Wow. Yeah. This is actually terribly <clears throat> important. Uh, but that the church, as in the believers, would go on until the second coming. In other words, the church would survive, but the Petrine church would have to do this. Why would that be so? Jesus is the head and we're the body. The head gave his life for the redemption of the world. And since the Petrine church claims to be the body of Christ as distinct from all the other believers who we know are the body of Christ, okay? Then the body must also lay down its life for the redemption of the world so that the whole Christ has actually laid down its life. By the by, the other believers, do you also refer to Jewish people or is it just Christian believers? Uh, if I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about all the other uh, Christian believers. I'm not speaking about Israel. Uh, yep. Israel is a different subject. Okay. Uh, and, and speaking about Peter and John, I'm only speaking about the, the believers in Christ that in, in actual fact, you can't destroy the church. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean by that is, Jesus said, if two of you come together, I'm there. Well, two of us are the body and he's the head. So they can't actually destroy us unless they, they kill off uh, 1.2 billion people. Uh, and even then the others will believe, you know what I mean? But they, they can't actually do it, but they can do it in the sense of killing off uh, prominent people and leadership and knocking down churches and and um, making life impossible and all the rest of it <clears throat> and they're going they're they're doing quite well at it now uh, uh, making laws national laws it's happening here as well uh, that are it, it's just making Christianity obsolete uh, so the, it, it, Christianity is being pushed out and it'll be, it'll become a bloody confrontation in, in the end and many of us uh, will have to give the witness of martyrdom, which is fine because that's the, the seed of the church. Uh, so it, it's that the, the, the church has the privilege of also laying down its life for Christ. And in, in that terrible persecution, which is not very far off, it's, it's quite, it will be quite soon because it's time for the Antichrist to manifest. Um, <clears throat> And as soon as the Antichrist manifests, he will not accept anything of the Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, in my lifetime, I expect uh, the, a, a very bloody persecution of the church. And the book of Revelation uh, says that the Antichrist will be given authority to actually conquer the, the chosen ones. That means to uh, do this persecution. Why would God permit that? It's because the church needs to be purified. And it's, you don't need to go into any uh, argument about that at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just the church as in its Catholic uh, expression. The church in all of its expressions uh, needs to be purified. And uh, one of the great mistakes that has been made uh, by believers in Christ is that we have approximately <clears throat> 30,000 sects of Christianity, all claiming that they're led by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity. Mm. Total contradiction in terms. Right. So it will be the miracle of believers coming together under one head and one shepherd. Uh, only persecution can actually bring that about. Uh, because we have to have humility before each other. Um, I remember saying that at a gathering of um, Protestant pastors in the north of Ireland, and uh, it was one of those occasions when the Lord made me brave <laughs> uh, very often. Uh, and so he told me to invade this particular conference with a busload of Catholics, and it was really unbelievable what happened. Uh, I remember um, that story. <laughs> just unbelievable what happened. Um, 
but we we realized very very quickly that what was wrong was whether we had no humility in front of each other hmm. we wouldn't wash the feet of the others jesus washed the feet of his disciples and i said to them when we get to the stage of washing one another's feet we'll be all right instead of throwing doctrinal arrows at each other you know what i mean and and all the rest of it but so that miracle of the unification of the body of christ and bringing back the seamless garment of jesus uh, <clears throat> that i believe will only happen through persecution so i don't see persecution as a negative thing um, persecution will also um, produce great witnesses um, i was in rome at the time when ralph martin gave that uh, fantastic mm -hmm. prophecy about the future I was actually in the audience and I was standing beside uh, one of our uh, lovely Protestant pastors um, and I said, turned to him and I said, do you think that's the truth? And he said, yes. And I said, I think so too. Um, and this is while Ralph was actually speaking, the two of us made this discernment um, that during this time when there would be <clears throat> apparently chaos, uh, on the earth in fact it would be a time of great glory because he said that the saints of those days would surpass the saints of old now how could you surpass the saints of old some of them were so heroic that you say to yourself how could you surpass them the only way is to live on a divine level and we have we've had martyrs of old and we have had saints of old but if the martyrs today are living in the divine will and offering their death with the death of Jesus in the divine will, that is going to be an incredible victory for the body of Christ. It's going to be an incredible victory for the kingdom. Uh, and that is actually required. But not everybody has to be martyred because some people have to take the message into the, the new era. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> So the, during the persecution, I believe the Lord will upgrade all believers to a completely new level. I, I keep praying for that every day, that the Lord would upgrade them, uh, enable people to enter into a much, much deeper relationship with him, that they would know him better, they would know him more personally. Uh, and so that witness to the world will produce an evangelization we have never seen before. And so the time of the persecution, while it will be uh, suffering and it will be difficult, it will actually uh, strengthen the believers and <clears throat> uh, it will put in very, very strong uh, foundations for the resurrection of the church. And I think the church will rise glorious. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pope John Paul II said that as well, uh, that first of all, we had to be taken out into the wilderness to be purified. The wilderness means that you will be eliminated from society, uh, <clears throat> uh, but that we would come back pure, P-U-R-E, which is very essential. Poor, P-O-O-R, which is really essential as well. The problem is that when we get rich, we get comfortable mm -hmm. and we start compromising with the world and all the rest of it. That's why I emphasized in that tiny little bit I told you about my childhood, that we were materially poor, but we were actually very rich. We were not only spiritually rich, uh, we were emotionally and rich and we were healthy. And mm -hmm. our communities were rich uh, in, in connection. Uh, all of that needs to come back. The so-called riches of today, which allows people to live in comfortable houses and in comfortable areas and have uh, supermarkets with loads of food and all the rest. It hasn't done anybody any good. It hasn't challenged anybody to grow. It hasn't made anybody better. Um, and so we have a few people in the world today who have enough money to run an entire country and to solve uh, the, the, the problems of the poor. Um, and they're only using it for evil. Mm. So that's not an achievement so uh, i see the the uh, persecution of the church as a cleansing a clearing out a sorting out of the human race 
uh, and uh, bringing in a new life, uh, new health, new growth. Uh, it, it's all very positive and it's all very soon. Uh, one of the things I discovered in the uh, calendar they use in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the final jubilee of our era begins in 2025. That's what I mean by soon. Yeah. And soon. a jubilee is 50 years exactly. So they said that our era, that's the era of the Gentiles, uh, would finish in 75. So that means that in that length of time, we're going to have the Antichrist and the persecution of the church and the death of the church and the resurrection of the church and the new era. Within a year, no, no, 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> Sorry, well, when, didn't you say 2025? 25 to 75. Oh, yeah. right, yes. In other okay. words, it's this century. Yeah. To put it in our language, it's this century. And and if, if you look at the messages that um, people are giving um, on the internet, I got tired of reading them uh, because mostly they're saying the same thing. Uh, but they're all saying it's soon, it's now. And in looking up these ancient calendars, yes, it is soon, it's now. Uh, and, you know, some people have said, um, oh, I would love to have lived in biblical times. Cheer up, you are living in biblical times. The most exciting of biblical times. And biblical times were not comfortable times. No. There were times when absolutely massive things happened. Uh, and uh, people made decisions uh, for the human race that were, were huge. And we are in that position. Uh, I personally believe that we, we need to look at everything on the broader scale. People are inclined to look at things on a minute level. Mm -hmm. And if you do, uh, you won't get the whole picture. I'm deliberately wearing this thing so that if you looked at one tiny piece of this, You'd only see a tiny little bit of white or maybe yeah. a tiny bit of black, but you don't get the whole picture. Um, you need to get the whole picture. And uh, there are people today coming to wrong conclusions because they're not looking at the big picture. Uh, and if they're looking at the big picture, you won't be afraid. Um, you won't be worried. You won't be upset. Uh, you just um, make sure that you are uh, surrendering to the Lord at the deepest level that you can possibly surrender. Uh, I pray every day that anybody living in the divine will would make their final surrender to the Lord. That This is it. Uh, from here on in, every thought, every word, every action, every movement, every step, everything is him, not me. But that's a conscious surrender. Uh, if we're at that level, then the Lord can do the greatest things he can do the most massive things you know wow so i wanted to ask you a few questions that came up um first of all about this time of um going into the wilderness does is that implying like um a refuge of some sort or how, no. how would no no okay. no um in the the writings of Louisa Picoretta, uh, Jesus is very clear that our refuge is the sacred heart of Jesus. <laughs> and where we go to our Blessed Mother and her heart is our refuge as well. That a spiritual refuge is much more important than a physical one. Um, but also, if there is somebody in uh, our house living in the divine will, that becomes a refuge for everybody else. And if somebody in our area is living in the divine will, then the blessings go out to absolutely everybody in the area. You become the refuge for them in the sense that you are the conduit for these graces uh, going out to them. So uh, I'm not concerned about physical refuge. I couldn't imagine any place in Ireland where, some, where uh, someone could have a refuge because <laughs> place is so small. <laughs> I mean, anybody would find you, you know what I mean? <laughs> you'd, I mean, you'd have to really go underground. <laughs> uh, so it's not it's not a physical refuge. 
in in a vast country like Australia or Canada or the United States, you you could find the you know the Great Canyon I'll just, or something. I'll just go to my back. Just go to my backyard. <laughs> and hide somewhere. There. But I'm if, you, if you have a a person living in the divine will in your house, you're okay. Yes. You just go back to the story of Lot. Now, and he wasn't living in the divine will by any long shot. But because of his connection with Abraham, the Lord decided that his house was safe for that night when all the attackers were coming. And the attackers were just blinded so they couldn't come in. They were safe. And when the Lord wanted to bring judgment on that wicked city, he took them out himself. Hmm. So uh, somebody living in the divine will is therefore, uh, <clears throat> I think, a refuge for everybody else. Hmm. That, that's only my own opinion. Well, but that's what, you know, Jesus tells us in the hours of the passion in the book of heaven, uh, the hours of the passion, that one person uh, in the divine will in, in, a, in a town that exactly. Town, the town will be saved. Exactly. Uh, so we're covered. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as we're, as you said, completely surrendered to the divine will and uh, living, offering everything to Jesus. Because that means you've allowed yourself to be a tabernacle of the Most High. Exactly. Your house is therefore the church, if I can put it that way. Yes. Therefore, you can go out to anybody. And what you'll find is when the crisis comes, which is not very far away, uh, the neighbors will know who to come to. Mm -hmm. um, yes. For people that are still learning, because we've got a lot of viewers, including myself, that are still learning about the divine will um, and trying to just comprehend the basics on, on what it is to live in the divine will, what's the difference between it the divine will and the gift of divine will. I heard you talking about that. Can you try to give us some more basics for people that want to learn more about, about it? Um, do you see this? If I lift that up, it's just a human act. Okay? Now, yeah. if I add an intention to that, I've improved the act. So now I'm going to do it out of love for somebody or I'll do it out of love for God. I, you can't see this here. Mm -hmm. Do it out, out of love for God. So I've now improved it. Um, if I do it in reparation, I've improved it. Okay, so it's not just a human act now, it's an act with grace. But if I ask the Lord to come into my action and make this a divine act, that's a different subject altogether. It means that I have invited the divine to come into the human and raise the human to the divine. It's actually that simple. People make it very, very complicated. Mm. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, unfortunately, if people are very intellectual, they'll give you big intellectual talks. <laughs> and ordinary little folks said, mm, obviously, I can't live that. Um, but uh, it's it's actually very simple. And so the, the little prayer that we learned in the early... Sorry, Miss Press there. Okay. The, the little prayer that we learned in the early days actually really helps. And it's Jesus' uh, divine will come and think in my mind, come and listen in my ears, come and see with my eyes and speak with my mouth and beat in my heart and act, work in my hands and walk in my feet. That's it. You're asking him to do everything. Um, a, a friend of mine whom you will get to know if you don't know him yet, uh, Greg Dunn. Yay. Uh, he was speaking uh, to a group and he there was an 11 year old girl in the group and he said to her do you understand what i'm saying about the divine will and she said oh yeah and he said would you ever explain to the adults because <laughs> <laughs> they have problems with it and she said but i asked him to come and breathe in my breathing so i just continue breathing
Some some people might think, uh, you know, they're just sinful. They're just got. They're not worthy for to to invite yeah. God to to live yeah. in them. Worthiness doesn't come into it. It's not, it's not possible for us to be worthy of anything. I mean, God is infinite, and we're finite, and we're not only finite, but we're actually uh, sinful, weak creatures. The worthiness doesn't come into it. Uh, one of the things that attracted me most about the divine will in the beginning uh, was the nothingness. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the most brilliant idea I ever came across. I was tired of humility and all the rest of it because if you if you say you're humble, you are saying you're humble, which means it's it's a prideful statement. Mm. It's very difficult to be humble. It's a good point. <laughs> but to be nothing is fantastic. Mm because it's utter liberation from self mm -hmm. and the utter liberation from self i think is one of the greatest things that god has ever given to us uh, when when i i mean my story about coming into divine will is really funny uh, but <clears throat> uh, i started teaching divine will when i was reading it for the first time and that's because my scripture classes were actually there and i was meeting them three times a week and i said listen folks uh, we now have to go into this as well. And since I'd been teaching them for years, they said, okay, that's fine. I mean, you can read the scriptures, you can read this. Mm -hmm. And I had no difficulty reading uh, Louise's writings at all from the very beginning, from the very first time I ever read them, I never had any difficulty with them. And the reason is that I had been teaching uh, Carmelite spirituality for many, many, many years and living Carmelite spirituality. This is all very familiar language. Uh, but when right. when Jesus told Louisa that she was an atom, initially I thought, that's funny. That's strange language to use. And uh, mm. I, I have a degree in science, which most people have no idea about. So th the scientist is not dead in me. I will, I will go uh, searching. So I went searching and I go on the internet and I, I found this wonderful, um, uh, depiction of the universe as an egg, a symbol of life, which is fantastic, and the billions of galaxies. And if you go looking for the, the Milky Way, it's only uh, the size of a pixel on, on the full universe. So then you have to, you have to uh, go down uh, millions of times to try and get to the Milky Way. So when you get to the Milky Way, there you have this wonderful <laughs> thing with billions of stars in it, you see? And you go looking for the solar system, and it's only the size of a pixel. So the solar system is a speck of a speck in the universe. Mm. And if the solar system is a speck of a speck in, your, a speck in the universe, to call uh, Louisa a, an atom was very big. It wasn't small. <laughs> that was what I was looking for, was to try and find out what was he saying. Mm. And when you go to the, the solar system, then to try and find planet Earth in the solar system, it's the smallest of the little rocks that are running around. And when you get to the, the, the planet Earth, you have to get down to almost tree level before you find these creatures who are so proud that they think they're terribly important. And so when Jesus, <laughs> when Jesus was calling Louisa an atom, he was compl mm. complimenting her and giving her a huge title. I mean, if if the planet itself is a speck of a speck of a speck in the universe, <laughs> how can we have any pride? I mean, there's no room for it. That's right. Yeah. I think I think the nothingness is just a statement of fact. Yeah. But it's greater than that. It's much greater than that, because God creates out of nothing. If mm. we put something in the way, a creator doesn't want it. So no matter what I put in the way, it's mine. It's not his. And so you go yes. to Genesis, he creates out of nothing. <clears throat> so if I present nothing to him, he creates. And that's how to grow very, very fast in the divine will. You put it used to pride, be nothing. The pride, the <laughs> pride the sin, the this, the that, the other, the world, and as you put it all out, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it, empty out, empty out, empty out, give him space, he will create. And he said he will create an entire universe inside of us. There's no room for ego. 
But actually, if even if you want a decent relationship uh, with a human being, the ego gets in the way. Marriages don't last very long with e uh, very strong egos. You see, and friendships any, as well. any relationship demands the surrender, uh, you know, for, for the two to become one. And so uh, what God has done is he's, he has written everything uh, into our own person, into our relationships, into our family, into our life experience, so that we will understand the principles on the spiritual plane. I remember many years ago saying to him, <clears throat> well, many years ago, it's really many. <laughs> I said, Lord, uh, you want me to go out uh, to the world preaching the gospel? I said, you used all these wonderful parables. I couldn't do that. What am I to do? What kind of illustrations am I, am I to give to people? Because I know I'm a trained teacher, so I know you don't just do straight teaching. You have to illustrate. If you don't illustrate, they're never going to get it. And that's what's wrong with intellectuals when they just give you straight teaching. Uh, the, 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 mind mm. has to take, mm. the mind needs to be relaxed with the story that you can take in this point or that point. So, you know what he said? You will find everything in the family. Everything, he said, is between the individual spouses in themselves, in their relationship, and in their relationship with their children. Everything's there, all the principles you need. And I haven't found them wrong yet. It's absolutely amazing. And that's why, if you want to understand <clears throat> surrendering in the divine will, because it's a person-to-person -person relationship, and in the person-to-person -person relationship, you can't have two heads. Mm -hmm. There can only be one. Mm -hmm. And in a marriage, if you have two heads, you've got difficulties, haven't you? So Yes, definitely. Yeah, someone has to take the headship. And that's one of the things that's wrong today, that there's nobody willing to let anybody have the headship. Uh, and to let the the relationship of love actually flow the way it should flow. Um, and therefore, they don't understand uh, surrendering to God uh, and letting him have the true headship. Because after all, he made me. He's the only one who understands me completely. If you think I understand me completely, forget about it. I don't. I'm a mystery. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So if I'm a mystery to me, I'm a mystery to everybody else as well. We know certain things about ourselves and we know certain things about other people. We don't know everything. I mean, if you produce symptoms, for example, why did you produce them? Sometimes you know, sometimes you don't. So there's mysterious things going on inside of us, influences and all the rest of us that actually have uh, projections on the outside. And if you get to know yourself to that level where you know everything about yourself, you're doing pretty well. Now, the more you know about yourself, the more you can relate to him. You'll, you'll know him as well. But the first stage is to get to know yourself. All the spiritual uh, authors have said that. That self-knowledge is the very mm. first stage of the journey. Because if I don't know, I'm egotistic. Therefore, I don't know what's blocking me from this relationship with God. I think one of the big problems that people have in the divine will is a very simple thing. And that is that they may have left out something utterly basic. And this utterly basic thing you will find uh, better in other churches than in the Catholic Church, and that is that you need to actually ask Jesus for a personal relationship with him. Mm. That we're not imposing a doctrine, we're not imposing a devotion, we're not imposing a, 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 a new spirituality or whatever you want to call it. This is a personal relationship mm. with Jesus taken to its fullness. That's actually what it is. 
And, and I think you're right. Um, a lot of people get confused when they think of it only on intellectual levels rather than on a relationship with Jesus and intimacy with Jesus. It makes it much easier to, to comprehend that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if, if the basis is a relationship with Jesus, uh, you have very little difficulty in the divine will. Mm -hmm. If the basis is rules and regulations, you have nothing mm -hmm. but difficulties. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I notice is that the people with the difficulties uh, have not actually uh, homed in on the personal relationship. Because uh, <clears throat> on the personal relationship, you see, if I'm having a problem in the divine will, what do I do about it? I talk to Jesus and I say, Lord, this doesn't make any sense to me. You're going to get it through, through to my blockhead. You're going to have to get this through to me. So he infuses the knowledge. He infuses the understanding. Is that Does that mean I'm special? No, it's just I asked. He said, ask and you will receive. Mm -hmm. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. It's all there. Yeah, I've heard you talk about, this is a, a little bit um, off topic now, but uh, infused knowledge and some of the gifts or the symptoms of living in the divine will. Um, and you, you talked about living, how Adam and Eve were living before the fall. Can you, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. That would be interesting. <laughs> Open-ended question. A little bit of time, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> he said a little bit of time. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Ten minutes. <laughs> Let's let's start with infused knowledge so to make it easier. Sorry Adam, and Eve, Adam and Eve had the full relationship with God uh, before the fall. Therefore, uh, you will read in Genesis chapter 2 that Adam was able to uh, name all the animals in the animal kingdom. Nobody told him. Nobody taught him. He knew about food. He knew about geography. He knew about everything. He didn't have to be told. Uh, when you uh, develop the relationship with God, even before going into the divine will, infused knowledge becomes normal. The Holy Spirit uh, gives you understanding. Now, I find that um, <clears throat> it is little people. By little people, I mean little in their own eyes. Uh, who, who get that and who understand it. Uh, I mean, one of the most impressive things I have ever heard was a lady in Belfast many, 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 many years ago expounding the scriptures. And she had never been to school and she had never read the Bible before the Lord uh, almost put it into her hands and he taught her. You'll find the same thing when you listen to Greg Dunn. Uh, infused knowledge is knowledge that's put into you uh, it's given to you you simply know it you, you, you grasp it um, the thing that surprised me most when I started reading the volumes of Louisa Picoretta was that none of it was unfamiliar it was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it had her flowery um, Italian side to it, you know, um, and the effusions of, of, the, of an Italian. But if you take that off, it was all familiar because it was the relationship with the Lord and he was bringing her into uh, being a, a victim soul and then bringing her on into a new thing. Uh, and so he was guiding her step by step. And he just journeyed with them and uh, no, it's no problem. Yes. That is amazing because I, I understand exactly what you're saying, that as you read the divine will and you read the book of heaven, it's um, it, it's it's like you, you read it and it's it's that aha moment. It's like, oh, yeah, I knew that. I, I, I got that. I, I didn't know exactly to put it that way, but yes. You know, because, because it's because familiar territory. It's familiar because it's the Holy yes. Spirit. It's it's God living in us. Yes, it's familiar territory. 
And the Lord has put it uh, like that for us so that you would recognize that what has happened to you is authentic. Yes. It's what's happening to you is the issue. And I keep saying that to people when, when I'm uh, explaining the, the volumes to them. Uh, this is given for, for you to register where you are at in this journey. And that th this thing that's happening to you, that you come to know something that, you know, you didn't get in a book, yes. but you, you know it in the depths of your being. You see, that comes from the, promo the promise that God made through Jeremiah. You'll find it in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. I will write it on their hearts, he said. Hmm. And when you come to read the writings of Louisa, you begin to realize how much he has written on your heart. Yes. Uh, and therefore, it should be an affirmation uh, of what is happening to you instead of somebody saying, well, this is up there. I'll never get to it. I have to do X amount of acts before I will get to the Say, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, when, when, when you are surrendering to the Lord, every everything I'm every word I'm saying is an act. Every glance is an act. Every movement is an act. Everything is an act. And once I'm surrendered to the Lord, he's using that all the time. It's not, it's not because I'm great. I'm nothing. It's because this nothing is allowing him to manifest himself. That's the beauty of it. And so what has, ha what has happened to uh, Louisa is the Lord is saying to us, this is what I'm doing in you. I'm, I'm actually bringing the new era with you. And you'll hear Greg saying this as well, uh, because uh, anyway, <clears throat> Uh, that each one of us who begins living in the, 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 the divine will, the new era has begun. Uh, if, if I had time, which I don't have, uh, as soon as the apostles and the other disciples joined Jesus, the Christian era had begun. And the, the two eras overlapped, yeah, as the two know. eras yeah. are overlapping right now as well. Yes. Mm. That the old is dying and the new is birthing at the same time. Uh, and so it might appear a contradiction, but it's not. It's that uh, life goes on. And so uh, I remember in, in a, a parish I spoke in in Durban in South Africa <clears throat> that an extraordinary event happened on one particular morning. And that is that on the third level of a hospital, a granddad died. And on the first level of that hospital, his grandson was born at exactly mm. the same time time oh, wow. it was fantastic uh, and I, I actually spoke at the the funeral and i said there's a time to be born and there's a time to die uh, and i said one breathed out the breath of life and the other breathed in the breath of life at the same time and that's what's happening at the end of these er uh, this this era and the beginning of the new era uh, and the new era can't happen if there are not people living in the divine will now. Sure, we're not living in it perfectly. Were the apostles living in it perfectly at the time of Christ? They weren't. Mm. They had to wait until things came to a fullness. But, but you are living in it. Yes. I mean, the apostles were already working miracles uh, during the three years of Jesus' ministry. So um, the, uh, the Lord keeps on wanting me to say to people, realize what I'm doing in you. I'm raising you up. You're part of the new thing. Uh, and uh, I've given you a testimony so that you will realize the beauty of what I've called you to. And you, you will uh, realize that I've already done a lot in you. Yes, there's more to be done. Uh, but the thing is, I've done a lot and go forward realizing, yes, I have this tremendous privilege. And someday, I will be back at my origin where Adam was because we have to pick up at that particular point and let the human race continue its journey throughout the new era, which is going to be absolutely wonderful. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be absolutely glorious. Absolutely. Everything, everything in our lives. I think this is one of the things that's been so, so wonderful for me to realize in the writings is, Everything that's happened to me in my life, every single thing has brought me to this place to prepare me for this gift. Exactly. 
And um, what nothing a, has happened accidentally. Nothing. And no. what a great re, what a great uh, revelation uh, to have that, uh, as I always say, it's not for nothing. Whatever it is, whatever in your past, whatever's brought you to this place, it's not for nothing, um, because God has prepared us for this great uh, fusion that He uses yeah. my will. I would say something to you personally as well. And that is that <clears throat> from where you came out of and came into, you've opened the door for the others to go into. Each one of us is opening doors. And what, whatever is the place we've come from, we're opening the doors for people to, to go forward. Uh, and somebody has got to be the person who goes up and knocks at the door and the door is opened and the people whom you have known will come after yes. you uh, and therefore it's 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 so important for us uh, not to uh, balk at any denominational uh, differences because um, the lord doesn't recognize that he recognizes a body of believers and we're going to have to come to to really understand that at some point yes in case in point you know i grew up a southern baptist and being a southern baptist i i was brought up with this love of scripture and if I hadn't had this love of scripture that was instilled in me, number one, I would have never really realized that the Catholic faith was true, uh, uh, ironically enough, um, uh, because I saw scripture in, in a whole new way when I came into the church. But, the, you know, that this training, every single thing that God places on our path, and it's not a, it's not a, a, a random thing. It's oh, a gift. No. It's a nothing, gift. Nothing is random. It's Nothing a gift. Different. Yeah, it's it's on. It's the moment we open our eyes to eternity in death, we'll suddenly see the entire picture makes sense. Mm -hmm. the entire picture makes sense. Brian. Well, well, I think we've reached the hour, uh, Francis. So, <laughs> um, if, you, yes. <laughs> if you'd like to finish off with a prayer for us and. Um, and maybe ask the Lord to help us remove all obstacles that are in the way to, to receiving that gift. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you said you would come to, with us if we gather together. And we have gathered together, Lord, across the miles. And you are present in your universe. You're present in us. You're present in everything that you have made. Lord, we ask you to reach out to every single person who will watch this podcast. We ask you to gather them to your heart uh, and to lift them up into this new relationship with you, Lord. Uh, release them from any obstacles uh, in the past or any opinion of themselves that they have because of the past. Lift them up from that, Lord. Liberate them from it and let them open up to realize that all of your goodness, all of your greatness, all of your love is all waiting for them and that you want to bring them to the highest place in your heart and in heaven. And we ask, Lord, that you would put your myriads of angels around them to keep the demons away so that the demons would not ever uh, convince any of us that this is not what God wants for us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that our Blessed Mother uh, would become more and more important to us that we would turn to her and that if anybody has any difficulties, that they would run to her immaculate heart and there they will find peace and there they will find themselves loved into a relationship with God. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of being together and we thank you for the privilege of speaking about you and we ask you to bless us and to bless our families and to bless the whole church today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Thank you.